Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of the Sermapod. This is the podcast to the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. I am the CEO and founder of Surma, Rich Lenkov. Really proud to uh, cover an important topic today, dealing with name, image, and likeness issues in the NCAA. More important than ever, in light of some breaking news that's happening all around us, we have uh, Will Palmer, who's an associate attorney at Kaufman and Knowles. He is out of Norfolk, Virginia, and he specializes in labor and employment, but also sports and entertainment law. Will, welcome to the Sermapod. Thanks for having me. I know you've talked and written extensively about NILs in general and college sports. I know you all also offer a really interesting uh, article in JD Supra, which can be found at jdsupra.com, dealing with the Tennessee and Virginia cases, which we also covered uh, on my other podcast, Legal Face Off, this week with sports writer from Tennessee. So obviously something that's on a lot of our minds who deal with this issue. Give us a little bit of the background um, of what brought us to that that case, and then we talk about that case a little bit more in detail if you can. Yeah, sure. And, and I don't want to backtrack too much. I imagine most people are aware, right, that we are in the NIL era, right? Ever since Alston in, in 2021, right, That's that seal was broken. Um, the next era, if you will, that we were all waiting for was the enforcement era. Right. And I and I would argue that that started this new year. Right. 2024 drops. NCAA has a new um, director, Charlie Baker. And suddenly, you know, the the crosshairs start dropping on certain schools, Um, Florida State being the first and most notable. Um, And that enforcement era, you know, was shockingly short lived. Um, Florida State got hit with sanctions. There are a few people on a short list that were up next for investigation. Tennessee being one of them. Virginia was lower on that list, but they were also one of them. Most of the people on that list for enforcement, though, were schools that had um, increased proximity between NIL collectives and the universities in terms of access to those students. Um, And the attorney generals of Tennessee and Virginia said, you know, we're not going to wait. We're not going to wait to get hit with a sanction like Florida State. We're going to we're going to go now. And they filed this antitrust claim, um, arguing that the enforcement of the NCAA's um, recruiting ban, recruitment ban, specifically the provisions that say you can't use NILs to recruit individuals to your institution, are anti-competitive, violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And so that's what triggered the litigation. Um, you know, it was kind of a, immediately a procedural nightmare, right? Because, you know, you have people saying, oh, we need a preliminary injunction. We need you to stop this as the trial's pending. Others saying that makes zero sense. It's just dollars and cents. We're talking about money here. Um, and so this particular opinion um, was to grant a preliminary injunction while the case is pending. So right now, the NCAA's hands are tied. They cannot enforce their NIL recruitment ban or any other rules that relate to recruitment uh, while the trial is pending. Um, and uh, yeah, there's been a lot of kind of procedural backs and forths that got to this point. But here we are, right, with the NCAA kind of hamstrung in the process. And what, give us a little more detail if you can, about what the AGs of these two states, Tennessee and Virginia, are arguing um, in uh, their complaint against the NCAA. Sure, yeah. Some of it's um, kind of par for the course. Arguments that have not stood the test of time thus far in the post Alston era, right? This idea of preserving the, the status quo of college sports, even some inclinations of the amateurism style um, uh, structure that we saw get shot down in Alston. The other piece, which I think is you know slightly more novel, was they tried to walk through the hypothetical of what's going to happen if you allow a full-blown free market NIL recruiting system and how it would hinder the uh, competitive, spreading out the competitive interests of college sports. Um, And shockingly enough, the judge is sympathetic to that, right? I I think this, we have to kind of divide out the notion here that just because the interest is not, uh, what was deemed valid did not kind of change the result here. And so the judge was acknowledged that the states have a, 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 sorry, the NCAA has a valid interest in spreading out the competitive interest, but the states specifically were saying, um, actually, this, this is going to hurt. Um, this is hurting these athletes. Sorry, I, I think I misunderstood your question there for a second. But um, the states were arguing that the current structure, the NIL uh, recruiting ban, is anti-competitive. It hurts the athletes in terms of their knowledge of their NIL value. Um, and ultimately, it, it's, it's stopping this free market of NIL uh, that's, that should be developing right now in the post Alston era. And so they really want to stretch this out to incorporate recruits, not just uh, current athletes. 
So, well, admittedly, for me, it's hard to follow. I know it is for lots of people who do this for a living, but let's talk to our lay people listening and watching. Sure. You know? So if you're a, a high profile student athlete, right, and you're coming out of high school and you're being recruited by, you know, power five conferences, let's say you're a great basketball player. Sure. Um, you're one of the top 25 in the country. Under the current rules, right, today, are you allowed to shop yourself to different universities using NIL collectives, using NIL as levers? How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So if we're talking today, right, underneath. Right now, today. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and that's exactly what I suspect is occurring. Uh, we are still in that, uh, you know, we, you mentioned basketball's example, but we're still in the, the football commitment window. So I imagine this is going on real time, you know. Right. I think uh, April 1 is, is the end of the recruiting window for D1 football. But, um, yeah, and, and, uh, and it, it kind of goes both ways. The athletes have now an incentive to shop them. The athlete recruits can shop around their NIL value. I also suspect that the NIL collectives are, are, are full-blown, full force trying to contact these recruits. Um, and, and it's funny because just before this opinion, all the collectives were kind of licking their wounds, right? They thought, oh, Florida State got hit. We got to distance ourselves from the universities now. And they were all headed out. And now they're all, they've all done an about face and they're coming back full force. And so, yeah, we are in a place now where these athletes are fully investigating the, the, their, the full extent of their NIL value, right? And short of some kind of appeal, right, which I haven't seen yet, I'm still waiting for. Um, short of any kind of congressional involvement, which, you know, we're seeing all kinds of clips on social media of Nick Saban talking in Congress. Um, they're going to keep exploring that. And I think that's going to shape the market, if not just for this recruiting class, but, you know, we know college sports, they already know who the top picks are, top recruits are for the next five years running. And so they might already be in conversations with them as well. And these states are arguing that, listen, let the free market dictate we should be allowed to recruit these athletes. And if under the current laws, we're allowed to use NILs and they're allowed to use, you know, profit from that, we should be allowed to use whatever resources we have in our individual states. And if other states can't compete, that's just too bad, right? And that's the yep. free That's in essence what these states are arguing, what their AGs are arguing on behalf of the respective universities, right? Right, right. And, and, and you know, there are still some, um, there are still parameters, right? And, and I think I push back a little bit on this notion of, you know, we are in a state of anarchy in college sports, right? The the opinion reserves the notion that there should still be um, a quid pro quo, right? There still needs to be some sort of usage of NIL here. Um, just in terms of recruiting, that can be a part of the discussion, you know? And, and I, I think a lot of people are then thinking, oh, this is just pay for play. Oh, now everybody's just going to get paid to sign up. Now, in practice, how do we determine whether or not there's an actual quid pro quo? That's a little bit more challenging. So there might be some stuff going on where there could be implied um, pay for play, but at least they can talk to recruits now. Before, that would have been a violation out front. And these states have really, they at least convinced this judge, right, that there's a, a greater interest in allowing this kind of free market NIL recruiting system um, than restraining it um, in, in the way that it's been restrained thus far. In reality, listen, even before NILs, uh, this was going on forever anyway. I mean, I'm not talking about people getting money. I'm just talking about the haves and have nots of college right. athletics, right? The reality is that an Alabama or a Duke or a North Carolina right. basketball, they've had the power forever, even though they weren't paying recruits, at least over the table. Sure. You know that there's a disparity in facilities, in you know, uniforms and, you know, all of that created a system of have and have nots before NIL. So it's really not that different a landscape. It's just that NILs obviously elevate the stakes so much more. Right. And, you know, I think, I think it's a great way to put it though, the haves and have nots. The question will, do I think there will be more have nots that suddenly have? I don't know. Right. I, I, it's kind of a mobilization issue, right? Can these schools get the funds together to suddenly become one of the haves? And, you know, it depends on how you define that scope, but if you remember the whole Jimbo Fisher versus Nick Saban debate a couple summers ago, right? I don't think Texas A&M is a have not, but certainly they it, they might be more equipped now to make themselves a part of that bigger discussion if they can get the recruiting um, in order the way that they were being accused of way back then. So you're right. You know, has will we see a dramatic effect on the next couple seasons of of 
football, basketball, and baseball and college sports, or even other sports for that matter? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, the judge actually acknowledges that. They said, the judge says, if we go to this free market system, it might not change anything, or it might not actually be good for the athletes, which I think is fascinating, right? What if these athletes enter this free market NIL world, they discover their value is actually less than what they thought, thought it was underneath the old system, you know? And and uh, we, we just don't know. And I think we're about to find out as this thing kind of pans out and we see, is there truly a market for NIL, like without any of these earlier restrictions? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, well, how do you think the Dartmouth uh, decision plays into all of this, right? We've covered that extensively at, uh, on the Sermapod and, you know, most people by now have heard that, uh, you know, the NLRB ruled that Dartmouth student athletes are considered employees and they're allowed to unionize. And, you know, many predict that as the beginning of uh, many other student athletes following suit and, you know, forming union and using their collective leverage to ameliorate their conditions. Um, many, again, see that as part of this overall picture that we're discussing today is perhaps pretending for the end of amateurism in, in college athletics. Maybe it's not that doomsday scenario yet, but how do you see Dartmouth sure. affecting uh, Tennessee and Virginia cases? Yeah, yeah. I was doing a speaking engagement um, last week uh, about the Dartmouth um, case, and I think the NCAA is in a two-front war right now, right? You have the NIL front, you have the employment front. Yeah. And in, in actuality, I, I'd be curious to see, you know, obviously Dartmouth has a lot of question marks around it. Um, Will this lead to profit sharing? What does that mean for schools that don't turn a profit like Dartmouth? What does this mean for public schools, right? Are, are these going to be employees of the state? And so I think that front is inherently more complicated than the NIL front, because I think that there's a lot of a lot more what ifs on the employment side. Uh, but um, I was reading an article recently that there's a chance that if they do become employees, if employment becomes the, the more pervasive model out there, and I think Charlie Baker even acknowledged that, you know, maybe there's a way to do it. Um, he, he said, what if we created this subset of college sports that did provide for schools that are that are um, employing their athletes? What if that destroys the NIL market? Right. Like we're not just it might not have the same value anymore if these people are getting a baseline of pay. These athletes might not be that interested anymore because at least right now, NIL requires some effort. Right. That quid pro quo is still there. If you're an employee, you're just getting paid, you know, and so. I think while it is a two front war, we might have dueling markets here that could end up kind of leveling themselves out. Um, at least that's my current read. We'll see how the USC case goes. I think the USC case is the more, um, yeah, potentially problematic if there's, if they're joint employers with the university, the conference and the NCAA, that, that could have much more dramatic effects, um, than the current Dartmouth case, but we'll, we'll see. Well, it's interesting. We're discussing this on the eve of uh, Selection Sunday, right? We're going to yeah. see some of these athletes who are making a lot of NAL monies, like the Zach Eadies, like the Caitlin Clarks uh, yeah. in the playoffs before they begin their professional careers, where, again, they might make less money than they've been making in the last year. So Zach Eadie being an exception, we covered the Zach Eadie situation yeah. in the prior sermon pod. He's, of course, Canadian and hasn't been able to avail himself of this money because uh, of the rules, you know, he did go to Toronto for a tournament. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, probably the two time reigning, he'll probably win player of the year again, hasn't been able to take advantage as much, but certainly, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of athletes who have, and um, Caitlin Clark, yeah. she, she embarks here in the, uh, in the postseason. It'll be interesting to see how these Which, athletes progress. That, that reality is becoming more and more prevalent now, right? With the, it, we used to see the one and dones, you right. know, like, and that was the, the predominant model for a lot of college basketball. Um, you know, I wonder if college basketball starts to look, look more like college football, right? Where you have quarterbacks that are in for seven, eight years, like Bo Nix and those guys, you know, because A, they, they want to harp hone their skills. They want to win a championship. Also, they can keep making money in the meantime, right. you know, and so. Right. I, I, I went to law school at Northern Illinois University. We've got a pretty good football program. Our quarterback just announced that he's coming back. And I believe it's his eighth season, believe it or not. It's, it's pretty unbelievable that Rocky yeah. Lombardi is now playing eight years in college football. But you're right. And, you know, I mean, that at the end of the day, as a, as a big fan of college athletics, like, to me, it's good. Because I came up in the era of watching players for four years and four right. I mean, the Christian Leitners of the world, the right, right. Robinsons, I mean, all these, you know, uh, the, the UNLV team. 
you saw these people not just play for four years, but in the postseason, you know, like the UNLV teams of, of Ogman and Larry Johnson and, you know, these guys, you saw them succeed in the postseason for four years. And that really made things exciting. So I think you're right. Sure. Hopefully one, at least for a, from a fan's perspective, one advantage is you'll see them stay in college yeah. because they want to hone their skills. They want to, they want to get their bag, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and the, you know, the, the hypothetical that I was tossing around recently was Bronny James, right? We knew Bronny, who Bronny James was as a freshman in high school, right? Underneath the current rules, he could be talking to NIL collectives throughout his entire high school career, sign an NIL, NIL deal, then stay in college for a full, like he could be NIL relevant for the better part of six to seven years, you know? Um, now there's other reasons why he will probably not stay in college for the full four years. But, uh, you know, I, as far as recruiting goes, this, like, this is the NIL model currently could really change the life cycle of your typical college athlete. There's no question. I mean, Cooper flag, you know, five years ago would have been a one and done guy. There's no question. Right. Right. Price in school for a while. I mean, the other guy they just recruited at Duke. I mean, these guys are going to be stars and make a lot of money. So, you know, why not? And again, at the end of the day, maybe that's better. Maybe that's better for the game. Maybe that's better for them. Um, so hopefully it'll all work out. But really interesting stuff. Like you said in your great article, it's the wild, wild west. Uh, these yep. days. Uh, check out Will Palmer at uh, jdsuper.com. His law firm is Kaufman and Knowles. He is uh, a leader in this space. Uh, Will, please come back on the Sermopod and keep it there. It's a really interesting topic. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.